This video is going to look at AQA A-level chemistry 3.11 amines, specifically focusing on structures, nomenclature and properties. The video is going to cover the structure of amines, naming amines, and a brief look at the base properties of amines, including a comparison of their strength. Amines can be thought of as derivatives of ammonia, NH3. And amines have the functional group, normally, of NH2. If we replace one or all of the H's in ammonia with hydrocarbon or alkyl groups, then an amine is formed. So if we were to put an R just in front of the NH2, that would form an amine. So here we have ammonia, NH3, and you can see the lone pair on the nitrogen. If we replace one of the H's with a CH3 group, then we would form something called a primary amine, shown here with one and the little circle at the top to mean primary. Now this is the same as carbocations and other things that we look at in chemistry, where if we have one replacement, then we call it a primary substance. If we were to replace another H with a CH3 group, for example, it could be any other R group, but here it's a CH3, then this would be a secondary amine. And if all of the H's on ammonia are replaced with R groups, then we have a tertiary amine. Now, because of the lone pair on the nitrogen, we can add another R group to that. So we could add another CH3 and end up with this species. Now this is known as a quaternary ammonium ion and can join up with negative ions such as Cl- to form a quaternary ammonium salt, which we will look at in later um, parts of this topic. Now one thing to be very, very aware of is that quaternary ammonium ions and ammonia are not amines. So the ones I've put in red here are not amines. So they're related to amines, but they aren't actually amines themselves. So if we look at these three structures again, the primary, secondary and tertiary amines, we can have a think about some hydrogen bonding and intermolecular forces. Now hydrogen bonding occurs between the primary and the secondary amines, but won't occur between tertiary amine molecules. Why do you think that is? Pause the video and just have a think about what you know about hydrogen bonding. Now, for hydrogen bonding to take place between molecules, there has to be an NH, OH or FH bond present in the molecule. Now, if we look in the tertiary amines, we can see that there is no NH bond present, so we wouldn't get hydrogen bonding. Whereas we do have an NH bond in each of the primary and secondary amines, so we can have hydrogen bonding between the molecules in those substances. Now, as with all topics for organic chemistry, there is some IUPAC nomenclature that you have to be aware of. So we're going to have a look at naming amines next. Now, the suffix that goes at the end of a word for amines is amine. Um, so most often that's what we'd be using if we're naming amines. But we always well, possibly might need to have a prefix, which for amines would be amino. So we're going to have a look at a few examples of naming. So the first molecule we have here is a primary amine, and we have a methyl group. Now, there isn't anything else going on here, and the amine is the main functional group, so we are going to use the amine suffix. This is called methylamine, and it is all one word. Now, some people might pronounce it methylamine, but methylamine is absolutely fine. And there are other names and there are other acceptable IUPAC um, terms that we can use for this molecule, but AQA specifically want you to call it methylamine. Now, if we have a secondary amine, where we have two methyl groups, this one, we follow standard IUPAC nomenclature. So we have two methyl groups present on the molecule here, and two means that we need to use the prefix di. And so this would be dimethyl amine. Di is showing that we have two methyl groups attached to the amine. The next example is where we have two different 
side chains going on here. So we have an ethyl group and we have a methyl group. Now, as with all IUPAC nomenclature, we like to use alphabetical order. So this would be called, and I just realized I've made the mistake there. So that's, uh, let's change those. Let's call them their proper names. So we have ethyl, methyl, and as I was saying, we use alphabetical order for this. So this would be ethyl, methyl, amine. And our next example is where we have a benzene ring as a side chain. Now this is a side chain. So this is a phenyl group, which is what we call benzene when it is used as a side chain. And then we also have an ethyl here, get it right this time. And again, we name this using alphabetical order. So this would be ethylphenylamine. So the side chains go in alphabetical order. Now we go on to some examples where we use the prefix amino. Now the first one I've got here, we are actually going to use the suffix amine. So I'm lying a little bit to begin with. We have one, two, three carbons in a row here. Um, which are all joined together with single um, single bonds. So this would be a propane chain. However, it's an amine. So this one here would be called propyl amine. Now, looking at the next example, we again have a chain of three, one, two, three. It's a propane chain. But here we can see that the amine is a side chain for this one. Now, when it's a side chain, we use the amino prefix. So this would be two amino propane. Now, in actual fact, we could get away without putting the two and the hyphen, because if we move the um, amine group left or right onto the one or the three in this, looking at it this way, as, as I've numbered it, it would be propylamine. Um, so, yeah, two amino propane, propane, best name to use there. The one at the bottom, we've got a chain again of three. So we've got a prop chain, but this time we have a carboxylic acid group. So this is propanoic acid. And then we have an amino group on the third so in actual fact, we need to be naming, uh, numbering it from the carboxylic acid. So this would be three amino propanoic acid. Now, the next thing we have to move on to is looking at amines as bases. We've looked at the bronsted lowry theory of acids and bases already, and that tells us that acids are proton donors and bases are proton acceptors. Now, remember that a proton is an H plus ion. OK, remember that it is a proton in the center and an electron whizzing around the outside. So if we get rid of the um, electron to form the H plus ion, we just end up with a proton. Now, bases are able to accept protons or H plus ions as they have either a negative charge or a lone pair of electrons. Now that's linked to strength of bases, whether it's a negative charge or a lone pair. So that's looked at in acids and bases topic. But because we have a negative charge, or in this case, a lone pair of electrons, we can, um, these, these molecules can attract and bond to a proton. Now, the Lewis theory of acids and bases describes these chemicals in terms of lone pairs instead of protons. Now, something that's an acid according to bronsted lowry theory is still an acid according to Lewis theory and the same for bases. So it, there's no difference there. It's just talking about how they're described. So bronsted lowry uses protons is the descriptor and Lewis theory uses the lone pairs. So according to Lewis, acids are lone pair acceptors and bases are lone pair donors. Just have a think through those two definitions there. Now, as amines have a lone pair that we can see just here on the N. So as they have a lone pair on the N, they are bases according to Lewis theory. Uh, they are weak bases because they only have a lone pair. So now moving on to look at the base strength of amines. As I've already said, amines are weak bases. They only have a lone pair to donate, not a negative charge. So they don't cause full dissociation when they're in aqueous solution. However, it is a sliding scale. So some amines are less weak than others. We can have stronger amines as bases and weaker amines as bases. And this is due to two factors, both of which you need to be aware of. 
The first is how easily the H plus can be attracted. Now, actually, that's the main reason. The more easily an H plus can be attracted by the base, the stronger the base is. But also important is how stable the ion that is formed is at the end. So if we look at the first one, this is talking about how available the lone pair is for the hydrogens to be attracted to. And it's all to do with the addition of R groups onto that nitrogen that increases the availability of the lone pair. Now, if we look at the primary, secondary and tertiary amines again, electron density from each alkyl group is pushed towards the nitrogen. So on this primary amine, we've got a, a methyl group and there's a lot of electron density around the carbon compared to around the hydrogens. So electron density is pushed from the carbon towards the nitrogen and in turn that increases the electron density in the lone pair. And as we go along from left to right we get an increasing number of alkyl groups. So for the tertiary amine on the right hand side there are three carbons, three alkyl groups all of which will be pushing electron density towards that lone pair and making the lone pair more electron dense and more available. Now I'm going to show this by using different sized lobes for the lone pair. The tertiary will have a more attractive lone pair than the primary. And as I said, this increases the availability of the lone pair to attract an H and therefore makes it a stronger base. Now, this electron pushing effect is known as the inductive effect. And that is something you need to be aware of. Now, the second reason for um, base strength of amines changing is to do with the stability of the ion. And additional alkyl groups that we add to the amine provide electron density to stabilise the cation. So not only providing the lone pair with electron density, but those alkyl groups will also push electron density towards the positive charge on the nitrogen and stabilise the cation. And so I've got diagrams here of the ammonium ions that would form when the previous amines would gain a hydrogen. You can see that we've got an additional hydrogen at the top of each of these. And we're also showing the positive charge on the nitrogen as well. Now, in the same way that additional alkyl groups stabilise a carbocation, which is something from AS, the presence of extra carbon atoms around the nitrogen also stabilises the positive cation. So we would again have these carbons pushing electron density towards that nitrogen, stabilising the ion. And this is another example of the inductive effect, which is all to do with electron pushing. So electrons are being pushed from the alkyl groups towards the positive charge. Make sure that you understand both of those. Go back and listen again if you're not sure. So if we look at these structures, just as a reminder, we have ammonia here. Now, ammonia has no alkyl groups around the nitrogen. So there's very little electron density being pushed towards the nitrogen. So we wouldn't have very stable ion necessarily if we form the ammonium ion in comparison to others. Um, and the lone pair is available. It's there, but it won't be as available as the lone pair that we have on this primary amine. Because on the primary amine, we have an alkyl group that can push electrons towards that lone pair, increasing the availability. If we add another alkyl group, then we have two carbons, two alkyl groups here, pushing that electron density towards the um, lone pair. And then with the tertiary amine, we have three alkyl groups, all pushing electron density towards that end. So it is the availability of the lone pair on the nitrogen that is the most important thing that you need to be aware of available. So we're now going to have a think about this process in a bit more detail. OK, and here we have um, our amines and ammonia listed from weakest to strongest. Remember that the tertiary amine is still a weak amine, but we're just saying it's strongest in comparison to the others. So I want you to think about this one. Do you think that an aromatic amine such as phenylamine or phenylamine, which I've drawn just here, would be a weaker base than ammonia or a stronger base than a tertiary amine? So are we going to put the phenylamine at the top here to say that it's weaker than ammonia or are we going to put it at the bottom to say that it's a stronger base than the tertiary amine? I want you to have a pause and think about what you know about benzene 
and see what you can come up with in terms of an answer. OK, now a very common answer for this is that people automatically assume that it is stronger because they think there's loads of electron density in this benzene ring. Now, it is the benzene ring that causes the, um, the ring, well, it puts it in the right place, weakest or strongest, but it is not to do with increasing the electron density. It's actually completely the opposite. If we think about the structure of benzene, um, and here I've got the phenyl phenylamine shown just here as sort of like the bare structure what we also would need to add is we need to add this sort of donut system now these are the delocalized electrons that we show in the structure as the ring so that's the ring just in the center there the um electrons in there they're delocalized they're all the electrons that are in the pi orbitals the p orbitals that um sorry p orbitals that would be in sort of this shape around each carbon atom and those electrons delocalize and form this donut system. Now what happens is that the lone pair just here on the N actually gets sucked in to that delocalized system. And those electrons in the lone pair go into the benzene ring and we actually get sort of an extension of that sort of delocalized donut shape. And what that means is that the availability of the lone pair is actually less available. So the lone pair on the end of an aromatic amine delocalizes into the ring and is therefore less available for donation, less available to be a base. And this means that aromatic amines are therefore weaker bases than ammonia and would go at the top above ammonia just here. Now it is really important that you're able to compare structures and think through the reasons that we've looked at in this video to decide if something is a stronger base or a weaker base. Now, future topics on this will be, as I've said already, looking at nucleophilic substitution in terms of preparing amines, um, which is looking at a mechanism that you've already looked at previously, as well as some other routes for producing amines that are a little bit um, better because there can be issues with nucleophilic substitution. And then also looking at things like the uses of quaternary ammonium salts. I hope the video has been useful. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll get back to you.